Mic check. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. <laughs> That's what our pigs sound like when they go to bed. The whoopies. Rob, this uh, doesn't get much better than this. Uh, the bus in the pasture, surrounded by the dogs and the pigs. Just thanks so much for having us. But love to hear. Tell us your story. How did you go from your previous life to being a farmer, a rancher, raising raising animals? Yeah. So it all started in spring of 2012. Uh, my brothers and my dad and I, we were sitting around talking. Uh, we had all kind of come to this fork in the road with different health issues concerning about uh, our weight, our aches, our pain, just typical things that a 20 something year old doesn't deal with normally. Uh, we were all active. My brother-in-law was former military. Uh, I was a college athlete. So extremely active people just dealing with gut health and arthritis and things that somebody that age shouldn't be dealing with. So we really started looking into the way we ate, what we were eating and how we were eating. And we realized that all these labels that are out there, all these organic, grass-fed, free-range, cage-free, were things we were paying extra for that didn't really mean anything. So essentially we came to the decision as a family, we were sitting around at Easter uh, in 2012, and we said, well, we've got a couple acres here, why don't we just raise our own chickens? So I took that as we were gonna raise our own chickens, went to the other room, ordered 50 chicks online, and came out and told them that we had two weeks to get ready and everybody was shocked. They thought I was crazy. Um, I guess I was a little bit, but uh, two weeks later, we had our first 50 chickens show up to the house, had never even raised a dog before, had no idea what we were doing, um, but we took chickens, put them outside on grass like we thought they should be raised, fed them in organic, soy-free supplemental feed, and within three weeks of raising those chickens, um, we put a little feeler out on Facebook and it sold all 50 of them. We didn't even get to eat one of our first batch of chickens. So, so you guys ordered them mm -hmm. because you wanted to, you, were, you guys were having some health issues and you just decided, hey, we want to find out like kind of how to raise our own meat. And so you did it, but then you threw it out there because you knew you weren't going to be able to eat 50 chickens and you ended up not even getting any of them yourself. My, my brother-in-law, he's an MBA, so he's always on the business side and he managed to sell 50 chickens before we even raised them. So yeah, it was the second batch before we even get a, got to try our own product. So now that you guys have raised the chickens and obviously you guys are, know what you're doing now, I mean, tell me about your health. How has raising your own livestock, how has it changed you as an individual or, or, or your family? Yeah, absolutely. So again, you really don't know what you're getting in the store. You can only trust labels so much and there's so much misleading labels out there that unless you actually come to the source or in our case actually raise them yourself you don't know what you're getting and so when we started coming to these you know forks in the road with our health and everything we started noticing a huge difference when we focus more on the paleo diet cutting out a lot of breads grains pastas wheats like that um, focusing on a more um, real food whole foods type of diet uh, combined with the way that we were raising our meat and overall the arthritis went away, the bloating, the gut rot, all of that just went away. Wow, that's incredible. Now, I mean, there is a lot of labels out there that, like let's talk about eggs, for example, that when you go to the grocery store that you just might be, you know, like grade A eggs and then there's uh, organic eggs, then there's cage-free eggs, and then there's pasture raised eggs. Can you help us understand what are what are all those terms mean when it comes to eggs? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll start with the basics. So a majority of chickens in the US up until the last year or two were raised inside in these giant grow houses, three or four chickens in a two foot by one foot cage. And that's how eggs were raised. So people started catching wind that that's how their eggs were raised. And they started protesting that these chickens were raised in cages. So then that, that brought rise to the cage-free chicken. So you still have them inside. You still have them smashed on top of each other in these giant grow houses. They're just not in cages. And so you're getting cage-free chickens. So single level in a warehouse. So they, can, they can't really walk around. But the idea is, is that they could, they could, move could walk they around versus to, right. being in a cage. So they have a little bit more room. But there's so that. many chickens in there compacted that they can't really move. They can't really move. But right. you can call it cage-free. 
Now, what about like uh, free range? What does that mean, a free range chicken? Yeah, so from there you take that same grow house and you go to the very end of it and you cut a little four foot by four foot door out at the end, open it to a concrete pad, and you give those chickens access to the outside. You've now created a free range chicken. Now, it may be 110 degrees outside and the chickens are in an air conditioned warehouse where they'll never want to go outside, but they have access to the outdoors. So you've just paid an extra dollar per egg for a, or a dollar per carton for your free range cage free chicken. So there's just a hole cut in the wall that the chickens can get out and you know, there's a few maybe that could actually get right. outside if they wanted to. Now what about organic? What does organic eggs mean? So to go from your cage free free range chicken to an organic cage free free range chicken, all you do is supplement the food as organic certified organic feed and it's the exact same thing. Chickens are raised inside in a grow house, just fed organic feed. So even though there's a picture of a, of a farm, farm on there, yeah. there's no farm. No farm. Yeah. Now what about pasture raised? What does that mean? So over the last couple years, three to four years, pasture raised has kind of become the gold standard. And when you say pasture raised, everybody thinks of what we're sitting in right now, these lush green pastures where the chickens can get out and move around, pick, scratch. Uh, but to actually be labeled pasture raised, nobody really mo monitors it. So uh, for us to say pasture raised, we had to submit a picture of grass. Nobody really came and inspected or anything like that. And so these pasture raised chickens that you're seeing are majority of them raised on just dirt lots. They're outside, but it's just dirt patches. They don't have the grass. They don't have the bugs, the worms. They can't really express the chickenness of the chicken. <laughs> I tell you, you're going to make a t-shirt out of that. <laughs> um, but essentially that's, that's where pasture raised is gone. So in reality, the only true way to know how your chickens are raised is what you're doing here today, coming out, inspecting what you expect and seeing the way we raise our chickens. Well, so can people come and visit like how I'm visiting? Absolutely. So we have an open door policy. We try to do farm tours once to twice a month. Uh, we actively invite people to come out, see the way we raise chickens. 70 years ago, everybody knew where their food came from. Right. They, they knew who their farmer was. They would come out. They would see what was going on. They would buy a chunk of the cow. They wouldn't buy individual steaks. But everybody knew how their food was raised and where it was coming from. Right. And then as we went into the Industrial Revolution and factory farming, everybody's kind of lost touch of that. But to really understand how your food's raised, you got to get back to the roots and come out to the farm. So you guys can come actually come out here to Primal Pastures and, and do a tour. You can come see these Ewok pigs <laughs> and, uh, and meet Mabel the cow and see how they're raising. I really encourage you guys to do that. If you're in the Southern California area, go on your guys' website at primalpastures.com mm -hmm. and, uh, and check out when they're actually doing the, the farm tours. And, uh, and you can come out and you can see what it's like. But what if somebody isn't close by and they're watching this? What, what should they look for? What are the questions that they should ask? Like, if you, if you didn't live in the area, how would you get the, the eggs uh, or the meat? Yeah, absolutely. So one of our big things is transparency. So if you go on to our Facebook page, if you go on to our Instagram, we always try to do live feeds. We try to update you from the pasture in the coops. We want to show you exactly what we're doing. We're realistic. We know it's 2020. Not everybody has time to carve out of their day to come out to the farm and, and see what's going on. So we try to be as transparent about that as possible. Um, we put our name on the brand, our integrity on the line. So everything we do is to the highest standard. Um, but if you if you live you know a few hours away and you still want the product, uh, we ship directly to the consumer. Okay. You can go online on our website, primalpastures.com. All of our products are available online, and once a week, we'll two-day ship it to your door. Uh, it comes up in an awesome Primal Pastures box. Everything's shipped with dry ice, and sure enough, within a day or two, you're going to have a nice box of meat on your porch. So, yeah, so if, if you don't have access to come down, you can order it from right. you guys. Now, the other options, too, is that if you go to your local farmer's market, and they're selling eggs. You can talk to the people that are actually raising the chickens and saying, hey, how, how do you raise them? What do you feed them? What does it look like? Where, where do they come from? And build a relationship with the people that you're actually buying your produce or your eggs from um, so that you can have a good understanding of where, where are they actually coming from and how is that gonna impact you and how is that gonna impact the environment? Absolutely, and it doesn't take many questions to weed through people that are lying to you. <laughs> 
So, what, what would some of those questions be? That What would you ask if you went to a farmer's market to buy eggs? What would you ask? Yeah, exactly. So you just need to establish rapport with the person you're going to be buying from and ask them questions like, oh, are these raised outside? How are they moved? You know, what, what do you feed them? What, is there a supplemental feed? Are they moved every day? Um, how do you handle the animals? Things like that. And, and if you start asking questions like that and somebody starts getting antsy and nervous, you know that they're probably not doing it right. Yeah, you can ask those good, those good questions. Meat has to come from somewhere. So you go to the grocery store and it's all neatly packaged in cellophane and we really lost connection with the roots of where, what farm did it come from, what ranch did it come from. Uh, but you guys raise a lot of your animals for consumption, for, for eating. Now, there's some really important questions that come with that. One is, what are they fed? What's their life like? Because although they did give their life for us to eat them, uh, they still need to be raised in a humanely way, in a humane way. What do you guys do to raise the animals in a humane way to really respect them? Right. So uh, here at Primal Pastures, one of our core values is quality, and the quality extends to the life of the animal. So uh, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We basically took nature's model, the way these animals would be raised out in nature, and we mimic here. We're not we're not doing anything out of the ordinary, we're taking animals, putting them outside on grass and moving them to fresh pasture every single day. So our ruminants, our cows and our sheep, they only eat grass. That's all that they can tolerate. That's all that they eat. Start to finish, grass started, grass fed, grass finished. Yeah, so maybe say, talk about that for just a minute. So let's understand. So now you can buy beef and you can buy lamb from you guys, but there are other people out there that are selling it now that might say they're grass fed mm -hmm. or grass finished. What are those two terms? What do those mean? Yeah, so it's another labeling game that they're playing. Uh, when grass fed first came out, every cow in the world that is started is raised on grass. You can't, you can't corn feed or feed lot a cow its entire life. It won't survive. It can't tolerate that feed. So up until about eight months, every cow is outside pasture raised on grass. Um, so that's where grass fed came from. And then people started tweaking it and said, well, at some point these cows were grass fed, so we can still call it grass fed. So then you got grass finished added to it, where that means, yes, the rest of their life is finished on grass as well. But then you got people who take those same cows, put them in dirt lots, feed lots, and just supplement them with grass, which is still better than a feed lot. But really the only true way to know how it's done is by coming out and inspecting <laughs> right so and you guys partner with a ranch in in northern arizona yeah and we love what they do out there we go out and visit the farm several times a year um, they've got it's not quite a hundred thousand but thousands and thousands of acres of just open grasslands that they start these cows on and then they've got some really really established pastures that they bring the cows in to finish them on and it creates just a very very good product so if you've never had uh, grass raised or grass finished beef, it tastes totally different. And it's crazy to say, but it is, it's true that if you buy kind of a conventionally raised beef and you eat it, you're like, oh, this is okay. But then when you actually get a real steak or you get real uh, beef that's grazed like this, it tastes significantly better. Absolutely. And it would be the same thing too with milk and with butter, mm -hmm. that if you're looking for a great product, what you wanna look for is something that is grass raised and grass finished. And the best really is to know where does it, where does it actually come from and come visit with that. Now, you have to process the animals. So you don't do any of the processing on site. How do you guys make sure that the integrity of the product goes all the way through from the animal being raised with high level of integrity all the way through the, the slaughtering and the processing and then actually getting to the customer. Right, absolutely. So we, we spend so much time on the quality of the animal that it would be a giant waste if we, if we just went and sent them to some random slaughterhouse. So uh, we, we've gone and inspected every single uh, slaughterhouse processing plant that we work with. Uh, they use the most humane practices available and the systems we have set up in place our, our animals will always be the first ones processed and they will be followed through and our animals will be off the line and marked and set aside before any other animals are processed that day. So we know that the effort we're putting in to processing these animals is being carried out from start to finish. So that way there's not any cross-contamination. 
you don't have any of you guys getting somebody else's right. somebody else's meat, and <laughs> uh, that's bad no matter what. Oh, that is refreshing. Cheers. Cheers. Want some beer? No, you pissed on my bus. You're not getting any <laughs> beer. I would give you some, no. but you don't piss on my on my bus. All right, we're gonna talk some more. Vamanos. Adios. Come on. There we go. <laughs> Mabel licked me. Dang, her cow, her tongue is oh, so rough. Sandpaper, yeah. <laughs> like, dang. She was funny. In the summer, I'll wear shorts for the tours and always forget. And she comes up and it's just like cutting your leg. I, I like you, but we're trying to do something. Look, Jeff's over there. He's attacking something. You should go get him. Yeah. So, Rob, you guys do something a little bit different. That there's sustainable agriculture, but you guys really go to the next level. What What does that mean? Yeah, so sustainable agriculture has always kind of been like treading water to us. We We want to do something that makes the land better. And so what we consider it is regenerative agriculture. And we do that by mimicking what nature does. So if you look at like the African Serengeti or the Great Plains, you always have these huge herds. So you have the wildebeest and the African Serengeti with these herds of hundreds of thousands to millions that come through and the grass is about this tall and they sit there and they eat it and they stomp it down, they poop, they pee, and then they leave and they let that ground rest for about a year. After that, you have the antelope that come in behind. They eat the grass down a little bit shorter, they poop, they fertilize it, they leave it. And then you have the birds of the Serengeti that come and they pick, they scratch, they push all the manure into the soil, and then they leave it. And then the rains come and it gets mixed back into the soil. And then the next year, all of a sudden that soil is healthier and stronger than it was before. So if you look at the Great Plains of the U.S., there were millions of buffalo there before. It's some of the most fertile farmland in the world. Well, it was up to until right. we started farming it, but the buffalo would come through, then you would have the deer and the gazelle, or the antelope, and they would come by and do the same thing, and they poop, and they, and they intensively graze, and then they leave it for the rest of the year. And it year after year, it became more and more fertile and more and more healthy, and the microbiome and the soil was healthier and the life and the quality of grass that was growing was just better and better. That's what we try to mimic here. So we run our cows and our sheep ahead of the chickens and then we pull the chickens behind them and then the pig come in as the cleanup crew. And by doing that and then letting the land rest, you allow that, that soil and that grass to really, really mature and become healthier and stronger and a much better product for the birds to eat. So you guys are trying to create the same cycle that nature produced in a way that instead of take, take, take from the land and the soil and then try to supplement it with chemical fertilizer and things like that, you guys are actually using the animals in a sequential order to provide good bacteria and aeration of the soil and then letting it sit and then coming back through and that you're that's part of the reason why it looks so fertile is because it really is because you guys are are really purposeful in the way that you are are stewarding the land right and absolutely and it's not just it's not just our animals that benefit if you come out and see the farm you'll see the amount of wildlife out here the amount of ladybugs and bugs and different uh, species of grass that are growing we, we've actually always considered ourselves grass farmers first. Um, I did notice on your, that in the logo, in it's the logo, not yeah. an animal, it's, a, it's grass. <laughs> and, and, and that's where it all starts. And to really have the healthiest animals, you have to start from the ground up. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then it probably does a lot for your water retention too, that you don't, you're not having to over water because the soil is actually holding on to the moisture much better. Exactly, so the, the water retention we have here is about 10 times what it was when we first started. So when we initially started here, we had to irrigate about an inch every one to two weeks to really establish the pasture. And year after year, as we ran the animals over it and let it uh, establish, then... <laughs> here, here's one of your animals Here's right one now. of the animals. Uh, and so year after year, as we ran the animals over it, the soil became healthier and started retaining more and more water. Now, from about October to March, we don't put down an ounce of water. Wow. And so now we probably irrigate every two to three weeks, we'll put down water over summer. 
and because the soil, the soil is so healthy and the roots are so deep that the amount of water we have to put down is uh, almost minimal. So you guys have actually improved on the soil since you've been here is what you're saying. Absolutely. So we did soil samples um, from when we first got here to after four years and it was about 200% more organic material in the oh soil. Oh my gosh, wow. Yeah. So that's a big difference because most agriculture really robs the soil of all that those good nutrients. It pulls so much of the topsoil off and then we get these areas that really aren't even actually able to be farmed anymore. Right. So you guys are reversing that. So one of the biggest polluters in the world is actually agriculture. And you guys are doing something significantly different than that, that you don't have these big pools of animal waste, because a lot of the factory farms have these big pools of animal waste. And then you have the loss of so much of the topsoil and the land. And it doesn't look like this, that most <laughs> of the US grasslands and pastures does not look like this. So who taught you guys how to do this? How did you figure out how to, to, to raise grass and animals in a way like you are? Because this is very unique and really is needed, but you guys went from buying 50 chickens with no idea to this. How did you guys, what was the, how did you guys get trained? Where did you get your information from? Yeah, so one of the unique things is my dad has been studying grass farming essentially for about 30 years. He's always been extremely into it. He just never really got behind it. And so once we started having these health issues and we started talking to him, we kind of put, you know, boots to the ground and, and made it happen. But again, we, we didn't have any experience doing any of this. So there was a ton of reading, literature, YouTube, uh, the the twenty first century made it a lot easier right. uh, just with access to information. Um, we failed a lot. <laughs> uh, my brother in law donned the term failing forward. So we we would always fail, but we would learn from it and right. improve upon it. So um, we we tried to learn. We we had people like Joel Salatin, who he's kind of like the the grandfather of pastured poultry. We learned a lot from his operation, and then just experiences and making the wrong mistakes and, and growing from those is a lot of how we got to where we are today. Wow, that's just incredible. Well, it's so successful. I love to, I love to see this and, and so grateful for you guys having us to come out and hang out with your, your animals and, and to hear your story and, and so much. And I hope you guys would check out primalpastures.com and see what they're doing. Order some, some eggs or some meat from these guys and, uh, and just really enjoy what it's like to eat really good, healthy food. And maybe later we're gonna do a little cooking show with some of their ingredients, so stand by for that. <laughs>